All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the New York Perspective. I have a, a guest here today. This is the first time we've chatted. Um, Griff, it's great to have you on. And we've just been jamming for like 20 minutes or so, kind of hit it off. I, it's, it's, I always know it's going to be a good a good sit down, a good interview um, with somebody I haven't spoken. I don't have a lot of people on that like I've never met before, never spoken to. I'm actually two weeks in a row now with people that I, I haven't met before, haven't spoken with. And they've both been amazing interviews. Um, I know this is going to be a good one. So I'm kind of reading the future there. But like, I talk to a lot of um, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners, um, just a lot of smart people, hardworking people, and it's everyone has a tough story. Like everyone had, you know, go through hardships and challenges, and you know, work really long hours and stuff. But it's like your your background and and, and serving and everything you've done for our our country and for your your fellow soldier, and then what you're doing with Comet Flip Flops and, and how you're how you've kind of come full circle of now also pushing an agenda and a mission of, of peace and help people around the world. Like it's such an amazing and inspiring story. And it's like there's no comparison. It's just it's a totally different level of like toughness. And so I'm just excited to chat and uh and I'll you know start it off with just saying thank you um for, for everything that you've done and continue to do for for us and everyone that gets to to do that like for me to get to sit here in, you know in a house in Orlando Florida and not have to worry about anything like all I get to worry about every day is just like uh you know how we're gonna do how we're gonna grow this business and this brand and like this you know this here this there it's just it's not it's not a, a comparison so again appreciate everything you you've done and excited to chat with you today well, thanks for the humbling introduction. I'm uh, stoked to be here, and thank you for having me on. Of course. Well, let's dive in. Let's start with like the not even like business related or marketing related or anything like that. Like we were talking about two things before we hopped on, and they're both very different types of things. And we'll we'll get to both of them. But on the on the thread that we just opened with, which is like the, the hardships and the challenges and you know, this show is called the Uniform Perspective, like perspective of, you know, this kind of mission you're on with an interpreter that you've worked with. And that is you know, basically we, and you can tell the whole story, but basically like, you know, we, we depend when we go to certain countries, we depend on imagine on people that are, are non-US citizens who know the, know the area that speak the language and that in bed with you guys and like are able to, to translate it and, and help. Right. And that like, they, they have no real skin in the game. They're not trying to protect us values or anything. They're just, this is their home and they believe in, in the same mission and put their life on the line, you know, line you know, day after day, year after year. And you know, there are certain promises made to these individuals. And it seems like these promises aren't always kept because it's, it's, you know, easy for us to kind of move on and forget about things. Hey, we had a mission here. We did that. And now we're just, you know, we're going to move our soldiers here. We're going to come back home and, you know, thanks for, for your help, uh, you know, but you're, you're kind of on your own. And it seems like that, that's what's happening with, uh, with an interpreter that you guys worked with, right? It is. So um, I'll just start with the bottom line up front is right. I, right before this phone call, I was editing a GoFundMe campaign to help raised fifteen thousand dollars to get him and his wife out of Afghanistan to Turkey so they can register as refugees there because the process of getting to the United States under the program promised to him has been eleven years in the making for rejections and there doesn't seem to be any hope for that process actually working for him. Uh, his name's Monir. He is served for US Army Rangers, SEALs, Special Forces, Intelligence Agencies since the age of 18, he has been directly serving in combat for 11 years straight in his home. You know, That's most wild. service members, they'll go for, you know, I used to go for three to six month tours. Most people go for 12. You know, the most you're going to hear is 15 months. And here's a guy who served 10 years, hundreds of firefights, wounded by an IED. You know, like his grandmother who raised him passed away while he was serving you know, our nation. And he did this because they had the American ideals and they wanted to bring those to their country. And he was willing to step up and put his life on the line to bring those values to his country. And in the long shot that it didn't actually work out, we made a promise to him as a nation, as an interpreter saying, we're going to grant you this visa called a special interpreter visa that allows you to come to the United States in the case that we don't succeed. And the enemy takes over, we know your life is going to be on the line. So you can come hang out with us. And that's what's happening right now. 
basically. That's what's happening right now. So he's been applying for his visa with West Point graduates, Green Berets, Rangers, everything else behind him, writing all the letters of recommendation, navigating the process from the United States side. He's been rejected four times. The last couple months, we have spent contacting all of our congressional representatives, all of the senators we can get a hold of, and all of the people in Department of State who are supposed to be managing this. And the response is uniform and, oh, we can't do anything. Congress is putting together a package. You know, you can write some letters. And it's really cool that they state that, but speeches aren't plans. Plans aren't operations and speeches don't turn into operations. And bottom line is, is there was a legitimate concern. You know, his land's been stolen from him. His home's been stolen from him. Him and his wife are on the run. They're living in an apartment in Kabul in a secure area. They can't leave their apartment because they'll get killed. And they're just waiting on, you know, the Department of State to come through on their promises, which is, I'm just going to be candid <clears throat> here. They're not going to. Yeah. The Department of State is ineffective in most of all things that they do. And especially when it comes down to like real human lives, people that have contributed to this country, they have a track record of failing them miserably. So there's a mantra under special operations is no one's coming. It's up to us. Uh, so we're trying to rally as many people as we can. And even if you give a dollar, it matters. You know, we it's $3,000 to get work visas for him and his wife to get to Turkey. It's $1,000 plus for plane tickets. You know, we want to rent an apartment for them for a couple of months there, a small meager place. You know, give him some money for incidentals while he tries to find a job and applies to be a refugee with the UNHCR. So uh, that GoFundMe will be up on our website, combatfilflops.com, here shortly. If you want to read more about Munir uh, and what he's done, if you want to learn more about the GoFundMe campaign, you can go there. It'll be right on our homepage. You can go click through and donate. And then anything left over after the funds required to get him out of country and supported for a couple months in Turkey, everything will everything else will be donated to No One Left behind, which is the leading nonprofit supporting uh, the veter- the interpreters left behind by state and the U.S. government through the special is special interpreters visa process. That's I mean, amazing might be the, the wrong word, but like um, it's frustrating. It's it's it's. First of all, like I think everyone, you know, if you're, if you're listening right now, watching this, definitely go to the go to the website, go to combatflipflops.com and, you know, at least consider donating. I think it's we we live such a a privileged privileged life, and this is what it must frustrate the shit out of you when you see like the news every day of just it seems like it the level of complaining in at least in our country, but I think it's it's across the board in most like you know Western nations right now, the level of you know entitlement and complaining about issues that are just in the grand scheme of things really small issues um and just the amount of time people are putting into like you know all these you know protests across and not even single out specific issues but just like in in the the abstract and in the general we, we live in a culture of like feeling like victims and feeling like that this is somehow trying to pretend like we're living in the worst time ever when it's clearly like the, the best time in history to be alive and you've hit the lottery i mean there are different spectrums right in our country but like to be born in you know this time in this country is is so lucky you're you're in the 1.1 percent of the one percent right because you hear stories about this and it's like it's i don't know how you could hear stories like this and and still complain and still you know move on with these you know these issues you have when it's like you have people that were you know are literally on the run and every single minute every day is, is a, a battle to survive after already spending 11 years doing that, right? It's like, it's not like this has just happened to them. It's like, this is a, over a decade of somebody's life, basically their entire adult life is spent trying to, you know, fight for ideals that we just take for granted. And then at the end of that road, there's no resolution for them that's kind of back at square one, because we have the luxury of just saying, hey, this isn't our land, really. Like, we're, we're good to just, like, things didn't work out. So we're just going to, we got our place here. We're good to come back here. We'll go to another country, another country. And, you know, good luck. And now the, the, the guys we spent a decade fighting, and we they know you fought with us. They're, uh, yeah, we're just not going to protect you. We're not going to get out of there, and you're, you're on your own. Like, it's, 
it's a totally different level of, of challenge, right? That somebody's going through. So it, I, I can't imagine like your, your just general thoughts on that, like frustration and, and anger and how you, how you deal with that. Yeah, I think anger is the right word. Um, I'm exceptionally sad and disappointed in our country and our leadership. And it's not just this administration. Everybody mm-hmm. tries to make a bipartisan issue. It's it's all of the administrations. Yeah. I don't like any of them. All yeah. of them fail in this process. And you can go all the way back to Vietnam. There's a very historic image of a Huey helicopter, like on the top of the U.S. embassy, putting as many people on it, trying to get it out as the Viet Cong are overrunning the embassy. And there's another image where they're literally pushing helicopters off of an aircraft carrier into the ocean to make more room for people to get out of Vietnam when when this happened. And I got to tell you, history is going to repeat itself. It always does. And this is one of those situations. And it's going to be really wild to see when it happens because you can write all the news articles you want and all the people who, who write these articles, they have some context, maybe if they've, if, if, they, if they've been there or not. But now it's going to be different because people have cell phone cameras, they have social media, they have internet connection. And so the level of devastation that's going to happen on the back end of U.S. foreign policy is going to be a broadcast in a way that we've never seen in human history. And it is going to kneecap our country globally. If you're an interpreter or you're somebody else working with the United States, whether it's with the government or with a business, you're going to believe that our word is invalid. We are not going to come through on anything that we say that we're going to do. And you'll go to work for the Chinese or the Russians. That's what's going to yeah, happen. That's, that's what I don't get the, I don't get the play. I, I don't get if it's, if it's ignorance or, or malice or, or what the, the goal is, but it seems like if your if your true goal is to, uh, to spread our ideals and our values across the world, right. And to get people that don't agree with us, to agree with us and to change the way of thinking and persuade people, like, you know, if that's your goal, that the last thing you'd want to do is this, which is like, hey, I the, the people that are going out on the limb that are already the easiest to persuade, basically just turn your back on them. Like, I, I don't, you have to realize, I, I'd imagine there's some smart people that still work for our government, right? Maybe a handful here or there that probably are like, eh, it's maybe a bad idea, right? It's like, it, it, these are our, our allies like this is how you change other countries you get a group of people that are citizens there and that live there to believe in a different school of thought and then they're able to spread that from the inside out like it's really hard and i'm sure you realize this to come in from the outside and try to force somebody what you need to do is get people on the inside to change their way of thinking and for that to kind of spread from the inside out but if you just turn your back on the people on the inside then they're just going to go the other way like you said they're just going to you know they're either going to become radicalized or they're going to just, like you said, go with the Russians or the Chinese or other superpowers that would love to have that person as you know an ally for them. Yeah, and they're going to go over to that person with a chip on their shoulder because of what we did to them and all the information they learned about us while they were working with us for the better part of two decades. It's going to be really interesting like to see how this is going to happen. And it's a huge national security issue. People complain about weapons of mass destruction. They can complain about nukes, they can complain about terrorism and all these other things, but we're going to do more damage to our country by not fulfilling on our promises than all of those combined. It's going to be sad. What and it's, it's that- really, really tough to to feel that too on the back of like so much loss and tragedy of service members, because in the end, we're the ones in the field that are taking the information from the decision makers, from state, from Department of Defense, from the president. And we are the ones who are being told this information and then we're repeating it and making promises on behalf of the United States to these folks. And then we're, we're leaving and then we're going to break it. And so it makes the service members look bad as well. I mean, there's going to be a considerable amount of survivor's guilt associated with this. And it just it makes it more dangerous, right? It just, it makes your, your lives more in jeopardy when you're out there because it's harder to trust people, right? It's like if you be, basically betray the trust of people that you're you need to trust so many times like what happens when they say hey we'll be your your interpreter and they they infiltrate i i it, it seems just like there's so many bad things that can can happen i guess like i i, I know that i've i've heard the answer to this question from from many service members and i know it's it's like they're not doing it for necessarily for the government at the end of the day they're you're they're fighting for the guy next to you and the, the other guy next to you like at some point, though, does this 
division between policymakers and the people making these big macro decisions, moving the chess pieces around and like screwing over the actual chess pieces that are actually enforcing everything and making everything reality. Like, how do you keep people staying enlisted and joining the military, right? Like that, that's what I was worried about is like, how do you keep that fuel if you, if the, the men and women that are actually making this a reality are like, we keep doing this, but then these idiots over here that have no idea what we're doing keep making bad decisions and just destroying a decade of work. I couldn't imagine how angry and frustrated you and the men and women that you fought with for all those tours are when you start seeing stuff like this. Like, hey, we we bled, we died for this mission, and then they say, oh, just this, yeah, we'll do another mission. Like, we're just going to retreat from here and move on. And like, I, I I can't even fathom the the feeling, the emotional response of that over and over and over again. It's 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 challenging, and I think the way they're going to do it is the same way they always do it with just great marketing. You know, they're going to come out with great books. They're going to come out with great movies. Everybody's going to feel the need to wave the flag in response to a national emergency. We're going to take the bait and we're going to spend billions, if not trillions, with government contractors, go down a path that we've done multiple times before, fail miserably. And at the end, everybody's just going to point fingers and nobody's going to take accountability for it. And, and the people that are going to pay for it are, one, the U.S. taxpayer, if you understood how much of your paycheck actually went to go to the Department of Defense and state for failing foreign missions, you'd be upset. If you're a business owner, you would fire that contractor immediately. Like It wouldn't even be a hesitation. They're so ineffective with nearly half your money that you, you, there, there'd be no way you'd be solvable, like solvent as a business working with them. You'd fire them. And then, um, you know, the, it's going to be the service member who's going to pay for it in the end. And we're already seeing this. We saw it after Vietnam. They, they tricked all the folks afterwards through the 80s and 90s. And then, bam, did it right again September 11th. And then now you're, you're, everybody's complaining about all of the VA. They're complaining about veteran suicide. They're doing all these other things. And they're stating cool words. They get some programs. They allocate pennies on the dollar toward you know fixing those issues when the real challenge could be solved if you fix the cause, not the symptom. The cause is just yeah. for poor and for poor foreign policy and leadership on behalf of multiple administrations. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's not a partisan thing. It, it's a it's a Washington thing. It's a it's irrelevant of what color your party is. It's just it seems like it's every administration does the the exact same thing, just in a different way. Like they brand it and they they position it differently, but the outcome usually is the the same. I want to get obviously to like you know. Comet flip flops and and the because I, it's a really yeah. cool business and the product's great but I, I do want to just like yeah I mean so this is a segue into going like why people see why we work so hard and all the challenges we've gone through in order to do what we do as a business it's for these exact reasons right here yeah I want to get into like I just want to pick your brain a little because your your perspective is so so unique and I love getting I could talk to people that are just like a, different like have just different experiences different insight different levels of, of knowledge and things. What do you think? Cause it, this, this is a, a business issue. It's, it's a, it's an issue I think across the board in every capacity, like with what's going on with like China right now, right? Like just at like a macro level, it, 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 it seems like we're kind of, it's, it's a, a war, but it's not a war. Like it's not the type of war you'd ever, and same thing with Russia. It's like this, this interesting dynamic where, we're technically enemies, but we both depend on each other because like China owns, you know, more of our debt than any other country. So it's like they can't, you know, you can't kind of wipe out this country because if you do, then you lose all the money here. And we really don't want to do anything because that's our, our, you know, future. You look at what's happening with the NBA. You look at what's happening with Hollywood. And, and it's like you, you saw, did you see the John Cena thing? I did the, see the, the John Cena, Cena apology, which was with... Apparently, I was listening to Rogan about this, like uh, Vince McMahon, like eight years ago or something, got him to learn Mandarin. That's why he spoke it so well, because he knew like that's like the big growth market. So he just all of a sudden pops up and you have John Cena speaking fluent Mandarin and apologizing for for calling a country, which is a country, a country like it's because, you know, F9 made, you know, 90% of its opening box office in China. It was like 160 million, 170 million opening weekend, 130, 140 was, was from China. Like 
How, how does that, in your opinion, how does that play out? It, it's it's a very weird thing. The dynamic so it, era. Yeah, this is exactly what happened in China is the same thing that's about to happen in Afghanistan. Okay. China helped us during World War II against the Japanese. Yep. And then after World War II, the Americans were supposed to go help the Chinese and everything that was going on. And we straight up abandoned them. And they have a huge chip on their shoulder and Chinese think in millennia. They don't think in administrations four years at a time. They think in thousands of years and they're willing to just slow roll the process, develop their technology, develop their relationships all over the world. And amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics and the Chinese in my travels all over Afghanistan, they're everywhere, all over Africa, they're everywhere. And they are building relationships with nations that have the natural, the, the resources and the assets to make your phones, to make your computers, to make all of the devices that we depend on and live off of and profit on. They control all of the raw materials that come out of the earth for those items by building good relationships, coming through on their promises to people in foreign countries that Americans deem as dangerous and et cetera, et cetera. And they do it without firing a bullet at all. So the, the Chinese are they're basically going around the world and they're collecting all of these assets and resources and they're paying the people, they're coming through on their deals. And because the United States, we are a very prosperous nation and we don't have people that still live in mud huts and squalor, barely. We might have some, but not at the scale in which China does. So China, you know, they can be culturally connected to these nations, say like Dominic, Democratic Republic of Congo where they get manganese and a whole bunch of other items that go into that are critical components for electronics. Afghanistan, one of the largest copper mines in the world, right? You need copper to run wire. One of the largest lithium mines in the world, probably the largest in the world. And that's what makes all of our batteries that we're going to be putting in all of our Teslas and all of our phones, like all of the raw materials to make all of the goods that we consume and depend upon. China is going through and they're building relationships to acquire all of those materials. It's, so they're, what they're going to do is they're just going to slowly choke hold out the logistics and anywhere Americans go to try to combat that, we're going to be you know, fighting an uphill battle because of all the damage we've done over the last four or five decades. Did we try, China, did, you, did we try to claim any of those? Cause I, I wasn't even aware of like a, a, nat, like a, a resource play in, in those, obviously oil you think of when you think of the Middle East, but when it comes to lithium and these other, you know, precious, you know, kind of rare earth minerals and, and metals, like, did we try to claim them, bring in contract, like kind of to manage it? Or did we just like, just leave? No, we did all the surveys of it. When we first hit Afghanistan, there was a huge, I believe it was USGS, US Geological Survey that did a huge national resource mapping of Afghanistan. And they identified all these resources and then Essentially, all of those resources got contracted out to other nations after we had all the data. This might be a stupid question, but why? Like, I, I, I can't. Like, it seems. It, it, I don't know why we, why we wouldn't just like, we're a capitalist country. Like, say, like, we're just gonna like commandeer and claim all the these mines, and we're gonna bring in you know all the big you know all our big you know oil, gas, metal companies, and we're going to, you know, sell, you know, bid it out, bid it off and they can run it. We'll bring in, you know, private contractors to defend it and it's ours. And then you can make a little bit of money back from the taxpayer for, for funding the, you know, a decade long war. I, I think it's an optics issue. If, if, if we claim that we went to war and lost human lives in response to September 11th and fighting fundamentalists and radicalism, and then we went into a nation which hosted, you know, the, the organization that claimed to do it. And then we went in there and started taking trillions of dollars in assets. I think the majority of people would get really upset about that. Yeah, that's fair enough. But it seems like it's it's the genie's out of the bottle. It seems like one of the things like it's you discovered it. It's that we're already we already made the commitment. We're already we're we're there. We we've already the the impact has been done. So now you have two options. It's option one is like, okay, let's try to make this a positive. We'll try to create, you know, jobs. We'll help bolster the economy because we'll give them the tech, you know, the locals, the technology to extract this. We'll teach them, you know, how to run these. Like there's so much positive that could have been brought out of it. That's option one. And then also, you know, make a lot of money, pay back some of the taxpayers 
be able to fund the VA and other program, you know, allocate a lot more of it to helping veterans or just leave it all, even though we know it's there and then let China come in and take it. And then we're just going to, it's, it's crazy. It's like, it's an illogical decision based on PR. Like you said, I mean, it's based on, this is going to look bad, even though it's probably the, the right decision if we did it right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of business owners, I assume, or aspiring business owners listening to this podcast. And yeah. so I, I'm going to go back to the the old mantra, if you can't do, teach. And if you can't teach, teach gym. So if you graduate from <laughs> Ivy League you know, business school and you can't hack it in the business world, you can always get a job for the U.S. government with your piece of paper that says you're an expert in business. And those are the people that are in charge of running the government programs and the billions of dollars and resources and assets that control those business decisions that could happen in those countries. So people that can't hack it in the private world go to work for the government and then they you know, get on their high and mighty horse that they work for the U.S. government doing good with ineffective skills in order to lead a very complicated problem in a very difficult environment. So you're taking a person that couldn't do that task in a first world or Western level environment where things are fairly convenient and easy. And then you expect to put them into a developing nation in the middle of a war zone to accomplish those tasks. It's a recipe for disaster. It's not, not happening. Yeah. And the U S government doesn't tr trust private industry to do it, you know, and, and it's not worth the risk of the private industry from an insurance standpoint, from a, a logistics standpoint, from an assets standpoint to put your people into these harmful areas, which is why we pay the U S government to do it. You literally can't get, for example, we were trying to do uh, aprons, you know, the aprons that Starbucks wears. Yeah. Those green aprons. So we worked with a textile factory in Afghanistan and we were bidding on a contract to make a small portion, just the tiniest portion of those aprons for Starbucks for their veteran stores. And Starbucks, they have uh, factory validation to make sure that you're not a, a sweatshop, they want to make sure you're following all the health and safety practices. So they have to send inspectors to your factories in order before they can place a purchase order to buy the items to be manufactured. So creating jobs, creating exports, creating prosperity, feeding families, all of those other things. And then I go, okay, here's the address. And they go, well, we can't send anybody to Afghanistan. Well, why? Well, because it's too dangerous. Okay, do you have a third party just a third party company that's willing to do it? And the two biggest third party factory validation companies wouldn't travel to Afghanistan because it's too dangerous. So here you have hardworking people that are capable and skilled. They can't even get somebody to come and take a look at their factory. It's literally you land at the airport, 15 minute drive over to the factory, sit in the factory for four hours. Don't even have to spend the overnight. You go right back to the airport, catch the afternoon flight back out to, out to Dubai, and you could be sitting by a pool in, in the evening after doing your job, but people aren't willing to take that risk. Private industry is just not willing to take that risk. And for some reason, the United States government, all these huge programs are trying to get a oh, large dollar investment. We want to see companies like Coca-Cola and GE and all of these other companies to to bring massive investment, you know, to move the needle significantly for the nation. But those companies have people that work for them. You know, the, like, who are you going to pay to go there? What's the insurance going to look like? What's the likelihood of success given the environment? And a company is going to look at that that project and go, man, this is too risky. It's not going to generate the return. We're going to go invest elsewhere. But for some reason, for the past two decades, the United States government feels the need to stay on this failing course of action. Strange. Meanwhile, wild. yeah. Meanwhile, we're a small business that's never taken a penny of government dollars, and we've been successful in growing out of Afghanistan for ten years. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Like, is so? How is is it just your you're personally willing to take that risk because you know the environment, you know the people, you 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 have the the skills and, and all of that. Is that kind of the, the the big difference? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Is you know, we have the confidence of being able to one fly there, go there, stay safe, not be an idiot. Um, build good relationship and then problem solve with our partners in country to get product out of country. And that's just something I'll, unless you feel personally motivated from the experience that you've had in your young adult life, you're not going to withstand the struggles that go along with that challenge. Now I've, I mean, I started this business by selling 
my hot rod, my boat, and a couple motorcycles and all the guns that I grew up with because I didn't have any money to start a business. I had no business experience, no e-commerce experience, no footwear manufacturing experience, but this sounded like a good idea. And we were going to problem solve our way through it. And we've been successful just through that process over the years because I personally feel compelled. I feel this is my mission in life. I get up every day. I love what I do. I feel blessed that I get to walk out of my front porch and stare at my flowers and you know, my kids are sleeping in a safe house inside and I've got more than enough bandwidth and space in order to contribute back and solve these problems. So I choose to do so and it's very fulfilling. And I do it with an amazing team of people that are on the same boat. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So you're able, like, is a private citizen able, like if I decided today that, hey, I want to fly into Kabul and, you know, create a deal with one of the, the factories there. Is that a, a realistic thing or is it really just like you need to have like you have kind of credentials and relationships, connections that allow you to kind of get get in and, and make deals like this? No, it's exceptionally simple. Your factory sends you a letter, say, hey, I'm inviting you to my country, you know, on behalf of doing business here. Here's your name. Here's your passport number. They're going to visit my factory. You know, we're going to negotiate a business deal for these exports. They sign their name, date. You take that letter. You send it to the Afghan embassy in DC with your passport, they read the letter, they approve it, they give you a visa, they send you your passport and all your paperwork back, you buy a ticket to Dubai, you buy a ticket from Dubai to Kabul, you fly there on the ground, your friends pick you up, you go to the factory, you do your work, and then you it's you just fly back home. And then after that, you're dealing with FedEx, UPS, or DHL to get your products out of country. It's not that hard. But people tend to overcomplicate it, specifically the US government, and they seem to make it like this arduous process that needs to happen when it's really not that complicated. We use the same process that every other manufacturer uses in China, except we do it in Afghanistan, we do it in Colombia, we do it in Laos. We try to find as many different conflict ridden areas to do that because we're willing to take the risk to do it. Yeah. And so like talk to me about the the idea because we kind of jumped in like just for anybody that's kind of listening now, it's not familiar with the the brand. Um, you know how it how it came to be, how it started. I, I love the 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 product, and you guys, you I mean, what, what's so cool about it is you've taken, and you can obviously explain this in more detail, but you've taken uh, materials that have been used for war and conflict, and you you've taken them, put them into a product, and then are using the the impact of those purchases in that business to do the exact opposite. To it, it's. It's really cool. It's really cool. So I've, I've told this tale a, a hundred times, but if you guys want, good. yeah, if you want to read, uh, if you want to read the book I wrote on it, and it goes back in our mindset. But if, I wrote a book called Steps Ascending: Rise of the Unarmed Forces. It's on our website for free. You can download it on ebook, and if you want to listen to me swear for nine hours, it's also on a free download and audio book. So you can get that as well. I'll so as we start, we'll get through all of the challenges, hit the website, check it out. Uh, long story, I did uh, graduated from West Point in 2001. Uh, June 2001, September 11th happened. I knew that we were going to war. I got on the path to special operations, ended up at 2nd Ranger Battalion, and then I went to Afghanistan. Within the first 10 seconds of leaving the compound, the gate, I got to witness the word poverty. It's the kind of poverty when people say poverty, like the image flashes back in my head. I can smell the smells and I can hear the sounds. I have never seen more poor destitute people in my entire life. And that was in the first 10 seconds of driving out of the gate. And we were driving for 10 hours that day to get to where we needed to go. And it got worse by the mile. It was sad. It was, it was shocking to me that humans live under such horrible conditions on this planet. Now at the time, I was with a second ranger battalion. So we were a very knuckle dragging, a hard hitting direct action force. And we were going into these remote villages to you know, rid them of Taliban and fighters who were taking safe haven in these high altitude mountain villages. And I witnessed lack of education, lack of clean water, lack of shelter, lack of food in the worst conditions you could possibly see in the world. And we were the representative force swinging the biggest tools from the United States Department of Defense. And there was absolutely zero way that we could change those problems with a rocket, a bomb, or a bullet. Zero. I'm telling you this from my experience. I'm telling you this from hundreds of combat missions. I'm telling you, like, 
from all over Afghanistan, um, all across Northern Iraq when I was, when I took a tour there, uh, I've traveled all over the world. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing the department of defense is doing to solve this problem that needs to be solved. And when we talked about it earlier, you have to, tr you have to treat the cause, not the symptom. Radicalism, extremism, terrorism are all symptoms of poverty and lack of education. And it's something that we could lead the way in as a nation, except we just choose not to because it's not just not as profitable. So uh, I did three tours to Afghanistan, one to Iraq, and then I got out. I went through the typical struggles that most veterans go through. Um, lots of drinking, drugs, fast cars, bikes, uh, damaging relationships, you know, all of that because you know, I went through all these hardships and struggles and saw so much loss and it felt like it was for nothing. Like, what was it worth? You know, I was going after the, the fairy tale that was sold to me through the eighties, be all that you can be, get an edge, edge on life in the army. If you remember that, that little tune. And, uh, I really struggled with it personally. Uh, I ended up going back to Afghanistan with a company called remote medical international. We were selling clinics and physicians and medical gear to government agencies working in dangerous areas. And I'd been in country for about two weeks. Uh, all I serve in Afghanistan is tea or Nescafe. And I'm a coffee drinker. And I met this guy. He said, dude, I got this combat boot factory I'm running. I got the best espresso machine in Afghanistan. I make the best cup of coffee in town. Come on by. So the next day I went by and it changed my life. I saw 300 people working in uniform, making combat boots and uniforms. These were illiterate people who were coming off the street, being taught how to make clothes, how to make shoes. So essentially being made tailors and cobblers, which is a lifetime skill. You can go anywhere on the planet. People are always going to need shoes and they're always going to need clothes. Yeah. And I was witnessing each one of these people supports five to 13 family members. So it was a huge community that was supported providing a better life for the kids than they ever had for themselves with a very minimal investment on behalf of the United States. It was just, I was dumbfounded. I, I did all of my work in the middle of the night under night vision, seeing the nastiest of the nasty and I never saw anything good. And this was the first positive thing that I saw was all of these people smiling and working happy fed, knowing they were going home to their families who were under the same conditions, roof over their head, food in their bellies and a safe place to sleep, sleep safer, I should say. So there's a very famous saying, it's called swords to plowshares. And a lot of people don't know the history behind that. But basically in the times of warfare, when people used to point each other, you know, poke each other with sharp metal objects, swords, um, it was very hard to make and refine metal. So after the war, they would melt all the swords down and make plows to farm the fields to create prosperity again. So that's swords to plowshares. And the United States is great because we took all of that military capacity used to make P-51 Mustangs and rockets and submarines during World War II when we can, you know, converted it over to make Corvettes and start shooting dudes into outer space. That's what made us good. We took all that military capacity and we leveraged it for commercial capacity. All of those efficiencies developed between 1941 and 1945 were put to use commercially to achieve a dominant economic position around the world. So using that same mindset, and if history repeats itself, we can use all this capacity that we built in Afghanistan during the war to make them commercially viable after the war. That was, that was my theory or my hypothesis. And I looked at the factory manager and I asked him, I said, hey, what are you going to make when the war ends? And he goes, we're going to make nothing. This factory is going to go out of work. Everybody here is going to lose their job and they're probably either going to have to leave the country or find something else to do because nobody's going to want to buy anything from Afghanistan. And I got absolutely furious. You know, it's, you see those little cartoons where they shrink and the nuclear bomb goes off to their head, the yeah. nuclear emoji blowing up out of the head. That was me in that moment. Just so frustrated that we were going to repeat the same mistakes we did after Vietnam in Afghanistan. And I looked down on the table and there it was, it was like combat boot sole with a flip flop thong punched through it. And it was kind of, it was a, it was a prototype made to solve a problem of shoelaces in Afghanistan where we were bringing in all of these recruits to build this army and 80% of them were illiterate and they grew up in a culture without shoelaces and we expected them to wear boots. And a lot of people seem to overlook this fact, but Afghanistan's full of Muslims 
And per Islamic tradition, you have to take your shoes off, wash your hands, wash your feet five times a day and pray. And I don't care who you are, taking your shoes on and off five times a day, specifically combat boots, is a pain in the butt. And if you don't know how to tie shoelaces. It's a disaster. <laughs> disaster. We're losing tens of thousands of man hours a day because of shoelaces. And the factory manager identified this problem and real businesses solve real problems. And if you want to charge a premium for it, you solve a difficult problem. And that's what it is. So he solved the problem of shoelaces by creating a military-esque sandal that guys could wear in garrison, but then they would change the boots when they go to the field. And it never took off, but it sat there on this table in its beautiful shape and form. And I looked at it and the words combat and flip-flops bounced around in my head and the juxtaposition of the two words and just the meaning of it. You know, I used to be an army ranger fighting and now I'm going to go, I don't want to make flip-flops products for peace and relaxation in the object of, in the, in the methodology of fighting a war. And I, I just like, in that moment, it just clicked. And I asked the factory manager, I said, Hey man, can I run with this? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I set it down. I walked out of the factory and I drove back to my hotel. I journaled for a couple hours. And then I called my ranger buddy, Donald Lee, who's our chief marketing officer. And I said, Hey man, we're going to make flip-flops in Afghanistan. And he's what, like, all right, he, dude. What was his response to that? <laughs> all right, man, let's do it. And I said, hey, can you check to see if combatflipflops.com is available? And he like, go figure, nobody put that those two words together. <laughs> so the main name was available for three bucks on GoDaddy. And we bought the reg we registered the company that night. And um, and that's how we started. So we sat on the idea for about a year. Then my brother-in-law, Andy, came on as our production and operations manager. And we sold everything we had of value. We prototyped some footwear and off to the races. It's been a crazy ride ever since. That's amazing to think. It's one thing to have a uh, an idea, like a you know a, a winning idea in normal circumstances, but to have it in that uh, that environment is is pretty crazy. Um, and so now you've also you're you're doing like other conflict zones too, right? It's not just just Afghanistan. Yes. Yeah, so our first. Again, it's it's all in the book, but I'll yeah. Long story. Our first our first factory run in Afghanistan failed. Our second factory run in Afghanistan failed. Our third factory run in Afghanistan failed, and it eventually led to my team building a uh, gorilla flip flop factory in my garage and us hammering out four thousand pair of flip flops thirty feet behind my kitchen and delivering to customers. Uh, so it's it, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. I said it before, I'll say it again. It's, a, it's the truth. You can't break it. Uh, but it's, it's financially unfeasible to manufacture footwear in Afghanistan. They don't have the raw materials. So you have to buy them elsewhere, ship them in, manufacture them, which is expensive, then ship them out, which is exceptionally expensive. So we shifted our, our footwear production to Colombia, and it's the same as Afghanistan mountain people suffering from a narco finance insurgency. You can replace war on terror with war on drugs. It's the same thing. Um, so we moved our footwear production to Colombia because they have a, a growing footwear industry down there. So we started moving our stuff there. We went back to Afghanistan. We found products that we can make in country. So scarves and textiles. So we, we do that. Um, we found another problem of landmines and unexploded ordnance in Laos left over after the Vietnam War. You know, a lot of people don't think about Laos when they think about Vietnam, but that's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. And we dropped a B-52 lid of cluster bombs over that nation every eight minutes for nine years. There's 50 to 80 million cluster munitions still alive and on the ground there. And it's the most heavily polluted area for landmines on the planet because of the United States. And over half the victims are children. So we, we found a company that was making jewelry out of landmines and uh, we work with them and now we make our peacemaker line. And so every piece of jewelry that we sell clears three square meters of landmines. That's, that's so cool. I mean, what's the, the long-term play like in, in an ideal world, right? You're, you're 10 years, 20 years from now, like what is the, the brand look like the product line look like the the ideal like impact right if everything goes right and, and execute on that kind of long-term long-term vision that you've set for the company so when not if when i like that everything goes right uh we will have put over a hundred thousand girls to school in afghanistan because for every product that we sell we put a girl in afghanistan in school for a day because going back to the to treating the symptom is lack of education 
Um, you know, we, we believe that if you educate women, you're going to educate a population. Educated women will not tolerate their children being uneducated. And if we educate as many women as possible, we're going to solve this problem globally. And if we do it in Afghanistan and we prove that it works there, then it can work anywhere. So our, our mindset or our mantra is that over, you know, 10 to 20 years of work, which is going to take, you know, we will be the footwear company that specializes or footwear or fashion company specializing in making products to create jobs in conflict areas and then promoting literacy in these same areas to promote security. I love that. I, 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 I like that kind of visualization and affirmation that it's, it's, it's when not it. I, I, I respect that. That's something we, we do with everything that we think about. Right? It's not, it's not even a question. It's, this is going to happen, right? It's just, it's a matter of, uh, the, the timing of when it actually does come to realization, come to fruition there. And I think more people are, they're really trying to be conscious about their purchases and their products. And you can go and you can buy something from Walmart for 10 bucks and it will do the job or you can find a, a small U.S. based business. It's, you know, service disabled veteran owned small business that's working to help people in conflict areas and you can put some good out in the world. Like there are good that comes from our products and more people are becoming aware of that. And the more people that find themselves through our website and our webpage are seeing that and we're, we're not smart. You know, we're, we're just really hardworking and we're a family owned business and we just got a whole bunch of really motivated people that are working to support our customers, providing them a kick-ass product. Our product stands for itself. Like we make hot products. Like it will stand for itself when people see the label of where it comes from. And then they look at it and they do a double take and made in Afghanistan, made in Colombia. What? You know, our product will stand for itself. And then when people dive in and they go, holy crap, these guys are helping other folks when they manufacture this stuff, then people will want to join onto that. They do every day. No, more and I, more. I agree. I think it's it's 100% becoming, it's, it's been this way for a while, but it, it's becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger part of the buying decision. The buying journey is where does this product come from? What does this company do with the the proceeds of of the purchase? All of that means more today than it's ever meant before. So there's always going to be people I think that just they they don't have the luxury of maybe paying premium, so they're going to go. It's just utility. It's like does this do what I needed to do, and is it the the cheapest option? But more and more and more people are you know that have that discretionary income are like hey, I, you know I can buy flip flops here here here, but this this company is actually doing something. And I want to be part of that. There, there's a, a bigger meaning to that that purchase than just getting a pair of you know cool looking flip flops that that are the most badass flip flops on the planet. I, I just I, hopefully there's a movement away from consumerism, and there's a, more of a movement toward purpose, in which you you I think enough of us know now that you're excited about buying something you think is going to fulfill you as a person. You're going to be happy. You get it, and in a couple of days, that feeling wears away, and then it's just something else yep. that you have to move to your house and clean around. It happens all yeah, the it's, time. It's it's uh, it's one of the, the big problems with a lot of people getting into entrepreneurship and in our community that I see happen on a regular basis. It's this belief because of some of the bigger you know influencers out there that are showcasing their things. There's this belief that if I have the things, I have happiness, and it's it's. Uh, I've been down that that road, and it's 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 you know it's hard to to shake it, but it's like it's a fact. It's you you always think like if I'm able to have this car or this thing, then I just have a lifetime of happiness. And it's you get you know maybe sometimes the bigger purchases you get maybe a month, maybe two months of you know uh, of happiness, and then it just fades and fades and fades. And it's like I remember when I got my last cars, you know. You, I want to go, I'm going to just, I'll get coffee. I'll get coffee. I'll go, you know, you just want to drive it. And then you're, you know, six weeks in and it's like, I don't want to go get coffee today. Like I, I just, I want to stay in. I, it's like you, you lose that, that thrill. And then it's on to the next thing. Like you're, you're never going to build uh, real fulfillment and real joy chasing things. It's got to be purpose and something that's, that's deeper than kind of that skin level. Yeah. And I, and I, and yeah, I, I joke about it often, but I really mean it is when you're wearing our products and they look distinctly different and you saddle up at a bar and you're a single dude and, and you're in a you know nice vacation spot and some girl looks down and is like, oh, those are nice sandals. And he goes, hey, let me tell you the tale. Right at the end of it, because he bought those purchase, 
because he bought those flip flops, a little girl went to school for a day in Afghanistan. And if that helps a guy like build a relationship and close a deal, then it was worth it. You know, it's, it, it, you have purpose behind your product. So a girl's not going to want to talk to you more. It's like, oh, I spent $140 on these flip flops because they look cool. No, That's what I spent flip flops and a little girl went to school. Yeah, th like this is the, you know, this is the, the, the purpose that we're trying to give. And we call our customers the unarmed forces because I don't care whether you're black, white, straight, gay, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Haitian, whatever. I don't care. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. But if you think that business is good, it's better than bullets. And you think that you know, putting little girls in school is a good thing. You're welcome to be on our team. And we'll, we'll, we'll welcome you with open arms. And we hope we call you go out and you spread stoke. I, I have a TED talk out. It talks about stoke. And it's that feeling you get from helping other people, right? We spread stoke with authority. And uh, that's the feeling that we want to give to other people. And it doesn't go away. Like every time I look down at my flip-flops, I know that I know the team that put them together. I know the families that you know put food to mouth because of the, the hard work that got put in. I, I've seen the schools where the girls go to school you know, they're getting an education to provide for their families. Like every time I look down at my footwear, I have a feeling of positivity and gratitude for that opportunity, you know, to make that contribution to the world. It's amazing. And I, I imagine it's the, the exact, whatever the, the word is for the opposite of that with most products, right? I think that that's the, the kind of unfortunate irony right now is that there's, you know, kind of diverging path where you have brands like yourself that are trying to fight, you know, the, the, you know, for market share and trying to grow and you're, you're here, you want to get here. And then there's these, you know, the, the big players that have the consumer products that are, are made in you know, very unethical ways um, just so we can have the, you know, the thing we need, right? Just so we can have the, the phone that we need and the t-shirt the we need and the sunglasses. And I'd imagine if there was, you know, just like you guys share the story of how your product's made, if that was happening with the other products, right? People would maybe stop buying them. Right? I'd hope that there'd be less purchasing happening because of that. It's um, because you, you hear these stories, how some of these products are made and the, the facilities are made in, the conditions they're made in. And it's, it's crazy that they're still selling billions of, you know, dollars worth of product X, Y, and Z despite those, you know, that kind of supply chain that's going into it. Very much so. That's the hope, right? Hope it goes that way. And I'm just as guilty of it as anybody. Yeah. Like I'm not perfect. Yeah. You know, if I need something to, to fulfill a job, whether it's a hard drive or, you know, a, a dust cloth for camera lenses or whatever, like I'll hop on Amazon and I try to find the best deal that fulfills the, the, the minimum need. If there were other alternatives or options that I was aware of, I would obviously choose those. But more often than not, I'm a busy person. I'm a single dad. I've got two teenage daughters. I run a company, companies, plural. And um, yeah, sometimes speed is 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 what I need. And whenever I can, I'll take the opportunity to do more research. But nobody's perfect. If you can, if you do have the space to make the decision, I hope you make a good decision. I love it, man. Well, I know we went, we, we went over and I, I appreciate you, you hanging out with me and, uh, and, and jamming. And I, you know, anybody that's listening, so combatflipflops.com is the, the place to go. That's going to have the, the GoFundMe campaign. It has your book and it also has the, the amazing products. That seems to be the, the place to go, right? For everyone that's listening. That's it right there. And if you want to connect with me personally, on um, Instagram, it's combatflipflops.griff, G-R-I-F-F. And that's it. Awesome, dude. Well, it was great chatting with you. I definitely want to have you on again and uh, wish you the best of luck with the, the business and also with that uh, GoFundMe campaign. I, I really uh, hope that that just blows past the, the goal set and you're able to get him to safety and then ideally as it, you know, into our country because I agree that he would make a, a great citizen from everything that I've heard. Well, it's not a hope. It's a reality. It's a We're reality. Gonna there we go. I need, I need to get into that, right? Yeah. And if, I mean, if, how many listeners do you get? On, on your average podcast you know thousand plus if every listener on there gave 10 bucks we could get him and his wife to safety yep and we could feel like a hero for doing so love it so there you have yeah. it so that's a matter of uh, another matter of when so 
appreciate it, dude. It's uh, awesome. And it just, it's, it's changing my mindset. So I'm, I'm picking things out from just our conversation. So great having you on dude. And uh, it's a good time to do because he just got back from his walk. So he, <laughs> Quinn's <laughs> calling it quits. He's like, it's, it's time for a nap. It's time to wrap this podcast. Um, but definitely have you back, man. And uh, good luck with everything that you're doing. All right. Thanks, Maxwell. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye.